No lie, I swear you were a roommate from hell. You might be overreacting, bro. Unless you're talking about my dark passenger. But even then, you really can't blame me. Shit. Man, before you went to college, we were roommates for like my whole life. No major complaints, right? Look, I don't care what you say. You remember you got me kicked out of my... No, no. You know what? You Remember you got me evicted from my first spot after college? Like, no financial aid, that like rent, that bro, was all me? Bro. We interrupt you from this podcast to bring you this important message. This podcast is not for children. There's occasional use of explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. This beat was made by the 21st century schizoid man. Now, enjoy the podcast. That was a very dark time for me, in case you don't remember. But for our listeners out there, I'll recount everything to the best of my ability. I had just bottomed out after risking everything for love. The girl had blocked me. I'd received a notice from the university dean warning me about my peculiar behavior. My transcript was now riddled with D's and C's. I was on academic probation. My scholarship foundation had halted all correspondence with me. I was given only one more attempt at continuing my education at the University of Michigan, which I would then go on to waste one month into that specific semester. Voices of the cause again. I had developed an abusive relationship with alcohol at 20 years old, not even old enough to legally have this type of relationship. The legality of many of my relationships had come into question. My mom invoking guardianship over me, the restraining order by against me by a girl who I barely knew, but the dark passenger swore I loved her. Also, soon my brother and my living situation, my scholarship's legitimacy, and standing with the university. My saga at Alden Towers, Detroit, my brother's apartment, began with another dicey situation. I was suffering from a relapse, and my brother knew it. My brother had ventured on controlling my phone usage but wouldn't go as far as taking my phone away or removing me from the bill. I was restricted to the couch as my living quarters. My room was a cheap boxy couch turned bed. Hey, first off, that couch was fire. And second off, we still use that couch to record to this day. So chill on the shots on my couch, all right? All right, <laughs> whatever. But back to my story. You also had a black beanbag and a an widescreen TV that seemed to perfectly accent the apartment. I desperately texted another girl I knew from my middle school days. We will call her Gwen. A long stream of texts with no response. My phone read, Hey Gwen, it's Moff and I love you. Hey Gwen, this is your last chance with me. Hey Gwen, text me back. Hey Gwen, I'm serious, text me back. My brother had gone out to get us some pizza, leaving me without any supervision. Big mistake. This relapse was most likely due to the failed pursuit of the other girl. Yet I thought I could somehow compensate for this failure by courting the love of another woman who I previously expressed affection for, sobbing and rubbing my eyes, crying out for Gwen's attention. This was the scene of my first night at the apartment. My brother returned and found me tears rolling from my face to the floor, shirt moist from rubbing my eyes. I think I'd arrived at the conclusion that no woman would find me as enough because of my mental boundaries. This, however, is absolutely a misconception. You are more than enough, even while mentally bound. For those that are feeling similar to how I was feeling, instead think about whether you believe a relationship remains beneficial at this point in your life. It may take us a little extra effort from all parties involved, but it is definitely within your reach or possible. But back to the story, you walked in and said, Yo, what's wrong? Why are you crying, man? To let you talk. I need to talk to Gwen. I was yelling through my tears. Where is she? Call her from your phone. Look, bro, it's midnight and she's probably asleep by now. No, I know she's awake. Just let me talk to her. I won't sleep without talking to her first. Oh, my God. Bro, this is not normal. You already got in trouble for one girl 
and now you want to go harass another? She loves me, and I love her. It's not like the other girl. No, it's not. But this is harassment. Think about your life for once. This is not a call, bro. It's stalking. It won't get you anywhere but in trouble. Stop. Fine. Give me your phone. He jerked at it. He jerked at me with his finger and said, "Calm down. Look, you being unpredictable and unreasonable right now." We hear a knock at the door. My brother goes to open the door. My cousin Nee walks in and says, "How far?" A common greeting between Africans, meaning, "How are you?" He sees me in my condition and gasps and says, "Uh, Muff, Muff, are you okay?" Tell him to call Gwen. My cousin, who was not yet familiar with my manic behavior, he calms my brother down and tells him not to worry. My brother insists that this will not stop, even if he does what I say. He was probably right. This persists much later into the night and ends with all of us falling asleep, watching some movie on TV. Thus ends the first night of the Alden Chronicles. Another prime night occurred about a month later in April. Yo, we getting lit tonight. What do you want to drink? Maybe he was rewarding me for a few weeks of good behavior. Look, hey, first off, I'm not an enabler. Y- you guys, uh, y'all obviously know that uh, people with mental health issues should not be drinking. But when I said lit, I just meant a taste. A small <laughs> look. I oh. just meant a small dose. Like I'm not that. I'm not that person. I know how he is. I know he's gonna drink <laughs> without me. But if I can do it in a controlled manner, then if I can do it in a controlled manner, I can't just tell him to not drink flat out, right? I j- I know how he is, so I tried to I try I tried to I tried to be there to control it. So just y'all judging me right now, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, but at that point, he did not know I had developed quite a severe and nagging habit for alcohol. I respond to him saying anything. He leaves and returns with a fifth of Jameson. A few hours of bad weather passes, and he comes into the living room to, to say, Yeah, you see the weather right now? I, I don't think we're going anywhere, man. And honestly, I got to work tomorrow. I'm just going to go to sleep. Hey, we haven't drank in a while. Have we? Have we? Have we? Have we? No. What do you have planned? Lately, I had felt useless and hopeless. So I believed that life could not get any worse, even if I followed what the dark passenger said. Grab the fifth of James and chug it. I check my brother's room first to see if he's asleep. All clear. I rush into the kitchen and grab the fifth from the cabinet. I cozy up on the beanbag, rack open the bottle, and face it. I start off thinking I'll start slow, but the passenger plans differently. <laughs> You know you ain't a lightweight, so chug that shit. I keep it held to my face until I retch in disgust. F- <laughs> oh, that's your that's your that's your retch noise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, what? <laughs> just just, hey, just go up. Just go on. All right. I finish about a fourth of the bottle in one hit. Another moment broadcasting live from rock bottom. Hey, live. In- <laughs> Live and correct from rock bottom. (laughs) Uh, I bring the bottle back to my lips and chug. I feel cool. Like my peers would cheer me on as I chug the swill again. Yay! No, this was not cool. It was an addiction. And my peers certainly weren't cheering me on. Those days had passed. I experienced a series of visions while I was teetering between consciousness and something verging on death. I witnessed a red yacht sailing on the Detroit River... As the apartment had possessed an alcove with a clear view of the river. I envisioned myself on Mars where I watched the sunset. I also remember an apocalyptic thunderstorm as if my former hallucinations of weather weather control were not enough. Eventually I pass out completely from alcohol poisoning and awake on the beanbag near the window to my brother standing over me in anger. The weather looks as shitty as I feel with the thunder clouds in the sky. Look, look. I just got one question. Why? I look to the right and right next to me I see a stain. I ask my brother what happened. To which he gasps and says, You know what? I'll tell you what happened. You fucked up again. See, that's what happened. 
I basically had to carry you to the bathroom while you were retching projectile projectile vomit from your mouth, bro. I got some of my shirt. I got some of my clothes all over. I just got some all over my my shirt, my pants. You lucky you didn't die, honestly. How? Look, how could you be so irresponsible? Look, I'm letting you stay with me because you complained about being too dependent when you were staying back at home with mom. Now, you want to be dependent on the government? Come on now. This would be strike one if he was keeping record of my mishaps. I'm sure he would have recorded it as such. Two weeks pass again, and thus occurs an experience to which I'm lucky to live to retell. And this is the first time I can recount this occurrence without the passenger's objection. Another morning in Alden Towers. My eyes open as my face lies in a puddle of my own drool. Over the past couple of days, I've been watching Naruto Shippuden. My brother was at work. The passenger convinced me that I was Naruto and needed to somehow extract the nine-tailed fox from my being. If you aren't familiar with the show, the main character, Naruto, from birth was forcibly possessed by an almost demonic-like figure named Kyubi, or the nine-tailed fox. The figure exists somewhat in like the Dark Passenger. He helplessly protested for control over his body, while the fox, whose manifestation in the series was metaphysically caged within Naruto, threatened to break free from the cage, which was sealed by a magic-like symbol, and take full control of his body. I identified with this. It meshed with my condition perfectly. It was comforting to know that somebody in media was just like me. Not only was my Dark Passenger the nine-tailed fox, but it also had come to identify itself as a new love interest. I had met a South Asian girl in one of my previous nights out, and the passenger had adopted the likeness of her voice in an attempt of exercising more control over my life. Like I said before, lately the passenger and I were vibing together. Misery loves company, and now the passenger had become my lover of loving company. Hey, hey, hey. I'm you, the nine tails in the show. I couldn't fall in love with you because the ink was tainted. Do you know how they get all the content on the screen? I humor the passenger and say, no. Whatever bullshit it told me, I would believe. Because once again, I was searching for some foundation in this free fall toward failure. They use the blood we give to hospitals. There is a world where animation exists, but you have to discover it later in life. There are certain passageways to this world, but you either have to find them or consume a certain substance for access. This substance is similar to the invisibility star in Mario. But it's a fruit. You will know it if you ever find it. Because it was like, like it starkly contrasts reality. Bro, what the f- What? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> oh, carry on, man. Carry on. I think to myself, that sounds like the answer to all of my problems. Really? <laughs> what? Okay, man. If you ever eat the fruit, you will be able to float between the animation world and this one freely. For now, your blood will tell a story of your animated life as it happened. The blood naturally experiences these events. And as it mixes with the ink solution, comes to life on the screen. Now, if you really love me, then you have to extract it from your body somehow. So just a clarification, this is still the fox. (laughs) I make a suggestion. Strange things happen when I overdose on liquor. Maybe you can get out of me that way. No, 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 no. In the show, Naruto, you can see only he sees the 
a fox. When he is pushed to his limits, he is in considerable control of his conscious mind. Yet the fox takes control. Liquor causes too much of the control to be given away to the substance. You need to push yourself to the limit some other way. I wander around the apartment, casually talking to myself. Up to this point, I refused to externalize the passenger by talking to it out loud. But like I made clear before, I was done attempting to feign mental sanity. Of course, no one was up. Of course, no one else was in the apartment anyways, but I'm certain that at that moment, to the outside world, I would be considered a madman. I make another suggestion. Run outside until I pass out. Hey, I want you to stay conscious. Now go to the bathroom. I go to the bathroom and suggest let the bathwater run and sit in the tub with my laptop plugged in. Would you do that? I say no, I don't want to get into any major trouble. Hey, 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 hey. maybe you could drown your head in the toilet. I kneel down, and just before I stick my head into the toilet, I see a glint out of the corner of my eye. We arrive at the same conclusion, almost simultaneously. Shampoo! I grab the bottle with my right hand and grab the bathroom door with my left. I fumble out of the room and open the shampoo. Next, I gurgle down as much as I can and run back into the bathroom. <laughs> what? I told you this is a dark time and you're just laughing at it. <laughs> what? Almost as quickly as I consumed it, so too did it exit my body. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. We shit. laugh now. Wait, so you, okay. So you, okay. In case y'all didn't hear. So he really just swallowed shampoo. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> projectile vomit straight onto the bathroom area's rug this was the most violent spewing of any vomit session I had ever experienced the passenger was silent for about an hour I thought I was rid of my foxer passenger unfortunately I was wrong and my brief brush with incidental suicide was all for naught I didn't know you could drink that much shampoo and still live <laughs> I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. then why can I still hear you I guess I guess I think to myself, Naruto, Naruto, huh? That's where I'm at in life. Life must be a comedian, because at that moment, I was mad with some type of glee, looking at all I'd been through, and I thought a veiled attempt at suicide would save me. That's it. Laugh through the pain. Another week down in the books of my time at Alden Towers. We're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. Now comes my midnight run. It was a couple hours before dawn. The weather was warm. And you just watched Batman Begins. And the Dark Knight. Now, it's time to watch The Dark Knight Rises. Don't forget about Batman the Animated Series. The one you watch while you were in school. Remember... I pieced together quite the story as DC Comics Media had ruled a considerable amount of my life at the time. I believe my doctor at Easter Seals, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the assistance of those with disabilities, was Batman or Bruce Wayne, and I was Robin or Jason Todd. Yes, I was a sidekick, but at least it was better than being the villain. If you don't know, the Skillman Foundation in DC constantly attempted to assume leadership over the Wayne Foundation. And in my life, I believe the foundation in our reality with the same name, intended on taking control of my future. If you remember, I expressed a bit of paranoia in Juvie, and also more so when their posters popped up in my high school. I'd watch most of my Batman material after the posters in Juvie, so this assumption of the Skillman Foundation was not retroactive. My doctor, we will call him Dr. George. Dr. George's profile reminded me of the General Bruce Wayne look. He had a similar enough voice, and because he was a doctor, I assumed he maintained a bit of power in society. I believed he adopted a secret identity to induct me into the Justice League. Also, Easter Seals was the Justice League. The Dark Passenger upgraded me from the United States Mental Corps to the Justice League. Now a certified arbiter of justice, a hero. 
My therapist was Catwoman and my social worker Wonder Woman. Now let's get back to Alden Towers, or as I believe, Wayne Manor in Gotham. My superhero saga was to begin at 2 a.m. I was to infiltrate the League of Assassins, the location, the Canadian border. Now if you're familiar with downtown Detroit, you know that Canada is simply down the street. But like most borders, they don't just let you mosey on in. Instead, there's a rigorous procedure for crossing into ca Canadian territory. Now my objective was to infiltrate Canada through the Renaissance Center. So that whole, wow, wow. So that's what you were trying to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm hearing this for the very first time. After this the whole situation, I didn't even. So when this situation happened, I didn't even really feel like asking him what was going on. Wow. Okay. So that's what that's what you was on. That's what your thought process was on at that point, huh? Interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. If, again, if you don't know, it's Canada's next door neighbor. The Renaissance Center was a twenty minute walk away from Alden Towers, or for our purposes, Wayne Manor. My brother was asleep, and I was ready for all sorts of trouble. I slipped out the door, making sure I closed the door quietly. The dark passenger told me to look for the big GM sign and followed until I reached the League of Assassins headquarters, or the Renaissance Center. Ten minutes in, and I get a phone call from my brother. I gasp and say, oh shit. I'm sure he's more bothered than me, not knowing where his schizophrenic brother was. I continue running when out of nowhere I hear his voice. Where are you going? How the hell did he catch up so fast? I assume he must have slipped out of the apartment around the same time I did. I just didn't notice him, I guess. I stop for a minute to catch my breath, and he appears equally as exhausted. Yeah, like right before, I think I heard you slip out the door, and then at that point, I just ran out of the apartment trying to chase you, because I didn't know what the heck was going to happen. Success is within the mile, as I reach the Renaissance Center. I reach the building, yet it's locked and closed. I get as near to the border as I can, and I'm stopped by a border patrol officer. Between me and the league are a security guard, the Detroit River, and an international bridge. My brother, now caught up to me panting and angry, says... By the way, remember you ran away from me again after I had caught up to you that first time. Yeah. But yeah, at that point, I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing, man? <laughs> I speak through my own panting and exhaustion and say, nothing. I knew he caught me. Dead in the middle of a rampant episode. He explained everything to the Border Patrol officer, and we were on our way home. No hospitalization, just a stern lecture. Once again, if he kept the record, this would be strike two. Next was the straw that broke the millennial's back. My brother left for work and instructed me not to leave the apartment under any circumstance. So what does the dark passenger instruct me to do? Well, it instructs me to do the exact opposite. It's about 3 p.m., two hours before my brother returns and my next mission begins. The dark passenger had adopted the voice of Dr. George, or Batman, and thus what? I <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Wait, Batman? <laughs> well, all right, so we talking Bill or Affleck? There's a very important distinction here what? that needs to be what? made here. <laughs> what? For real. Did your dark passenger take on the voice of Christian Bale or Ben Affleck? Oh my, oh my God. I, Bale, I guess. Run to the building. A couple blocks away. Barefoot. It's another planet. Pluto. I get outside and run on the balls of my feet toward Pluto. It is about 40 degrees. I reach the building and wait for the passenger's next instructions. Climb the dumpster and roll in it. I do as it commands. Folks, this dumpster was full of all kinds of filth. It was not empty. It was full. I repeat, it was not empty. It was full. Go back into the building and pull the fire alarm. I run into the building and hesitate. My feet are aching from the barefoot run. I think to myself in my brother's voice, What the hell are you doing? My hesitation lasts for like 13 minutes. Until I finally strike up the courage to pull the fire alarm. I pull it. The alarm goes off and I wait for my next commands. I'm sure there were cameras and act as such. Run back to Wayne Manor. I burst out the door running swift as I could over rocky and cold asphalt. I didn't know I could run that fast. I reached the building and used my key to enter the building. At the apartment entrance desk is a heavy set woman watching me. I catch my breath and try to act cool. 
I wait for the passenger. Go to the fourth floor. This is strange. We live on the eighth floor, not the fourth. I oblige anyways. By now, it had adopted the voice of someone from my former scholarship chapter. Hey, welcome Welcome to the mouse trap. trap. If you escape, a reward reward beyond your wildest wildest dreams dreams is yours. yours. Knock Knock on the door door and the end end of the hall hall, and you run back back to the the elevator. elevator. Once again, I oblige. Next, what happens is what I know will be the third strike or the straw that broke the millennials back. Take off off all your clothes clothes and lick lick the peephole of the the next next apartment apartment door door that you see. I rip my clothes off and sit in the corner of the elevator. The elevator takes me to the ninth floor. I exit and lick the peephole of the door. Next, I'm going to need you to knock on every door you can. At least until someone lets you in. And as soon as the door opens, you bust into their apartment. Okay? I knock on about three doors. And on the fourth, as the door opens, I hear a scream. And I barrel through the doorway. I see a woman run towards her couch and the dark passenger commands me again. Run, run into the into bedroom, bedroom and, and run, run out, of out of the apartment, apartment to the roof. I followed the commands to the T. The phone is pressed to her ear as she's probably calling the police. Before I'm done, the passenger has me knock on a couple more doors and cause a little bit more chaos. After knocking on a few more doors, I am cornered in the elevator. A police officer finds me and threatens me with his nightstick. Not the best choice of words, but... <laughs> Good. Sorry. Not the best choice of words, but this is what really happened. He's a black officer, heavy set and authoritative. Authoritative. Jack boys. Easter egg. Okay. Ignore me. So ignore me. <laughs> hey, hey, where are you close, sir? Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> Boy, stand up and don't make any slight movements, all right? I stand and face the wall. Here, take this. Where, where, put this on. Here, wear this. Put this on. He hands me a pair of boxers. I'm not sure where he got them from. T- boy, t- just turn around. Face the wall. He cuts me, and it's off to the hospital. If this was still on the record, this would be more than strike three. It would be an out and a lost game. But he, but he wasn't keeping a record. Alden Towers had held a record enough for me, and it was over. Folks, the game was over, and it was quite an eventful one. I guess I had escaped that mousetrap, and I would share the reward with my brother. Hey, congrats, buddy. You made it. My, my brother later that day had heard the news. What a surprise he was in for. An eviction notice giving him a couple days to vacate the premises. There was no home court advantage, no crowd, no scoreboard. Nothing. I just knew that I was losing, and by how much, it was impossible to tell. Hey, you, you know the crazy thing is? What? You actually, you, do you remember you actually used my name? You gave it to the apartment complex and the police? <laughs> like, <laughs> but uh, that's, you know what? We, we, get, we got stories for days, man. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have any creative or goofy ending today. Thanks for listening to uh, the 21st Century Schizoid Man podcast. This this and the last episode were definitely two rough episodes for him to write. And uh, um, he's learned a lot from these experiences. Trust True. me. Um, uh, he, these, these experiences have really shaped the person he is today and uh, just have helped him in just kind of dealing with mental health issues and his relationships with other people. But uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you in episode nine. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah.